Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to um, another edition of our Infectious Disease Podcast. Uh, this is a, a re-recording from a lecture given September the 5th, 2018. I'm uh, Dr. Jamie Morano from the University of South Florida, and we're talking today about HIV resistance, called Meeting the Resistance Movement Up Close and Personal. And I wanted to um, use some of the slides that we have in circulation and try to explain a little bit um, what we can do to understand HIV resistance and what we can do about it. Um, I do have these conflicts of interest to disclose, but it shouldn't um, affect any of uh, our talk today. Um, today we'd like to understand the latest epidemiology in HIV infection in Florida, uh, understands the basics of HIV virology, understand the causes of HIV resistance, and understand how to manage HIV resistance. Why is HIV important to understand, especially for um, those of you in uh, maybe surgical professions or general internal medicine practice? Well, across the United States and specifically in the Southeast of the United States, we have a very high incidence and prevalence of, of HIV. Um, this virus causes immunosuppression and other comorbidities. Um, and so this, this really is important to, to understand for any practicing healthcare provider. The South has a um, undue burden of new infection, 53% of new infections in 2016. Um, that's compared to the Northeast at um, only 17%. Um, also bring you to attention that we have a, a changing demographic of new HIV infection, especially in the Southeast, and it's important to make sure that we uh, message, message our prevention and linkage to care strategies um, to reach all populations. And this is Florida specifically. Um, the cases in Florida have declined, uh, but they, they are uh, still, uh, there is still a prevalence. And HIV infection case rates by county. Uh, you can see here we're in Hillsborough uh, County and, and Pinellas is our neighbor. We have a, a definitely a high burden of disease not as high as Miami, Dade, and Broward, but still very high in, in needing attention. Um, this is our percentage of adult HIV infection AIDS cases um, also in Florida. Um, you can see that HIV affects all people, um, but there are disproportional uh, infections uh, as well. Uh, I'd like to talk to HIV viral replication and ART active sites, and I want to uh, really highlight um, this is from the uh, NAID site, which is a, a wonderful way of visualizing the HIV virus. Um, first of all, the HIV virus fuses to the host cell surface, and we have medicines that will interact um, with this called fusion inhibitors. The next step is that the HIV RNA and other viral proteins will enter the host cell. And those are our NNRTIs and uh, the nukes or non-nukes reverse transcriptase inhibitors. The integrase inhibitors uh, will prevent, as they, they seem to say, they will inhibit the integration of the viral, um, the, the RNA into the, the host uh, DNA. The protease inhibitors are also very important. Um, they will inhibit the um, protease enzyme and the maturation inhibitors will uh, prevent the budding. Now, I want to highlight the National HIV Curriculum. This is available free of charge. Um, and you can see the website at the bottom of the slide. Um, it's an amazing uh, compendium of HIV, free HIV, uh, CME, and education materials. And you can actually earn CME credit. And it, it's a really brilliant um, training session. And I'm, I'm using many of the slides just because I, I want to um, facilitate some of that training and I think they do it very well but I wanted to make sure that you went to their original site and um, followed along uh, with their their excellent uh, illustrations and guidance. Um, this slide is to show that HIV as a virus does have a reasonably high error rate. Um, there's one misincorporation of the nucleotides for every 5,000 to 7,000 nucleotides polymerized so there is a natural error rate um, that will be causing mutations in baseline. Um, and as you can imagine, with all of the, the difficulties in incorporating the, um, the nucleotides and nucleosides, um, the medications you probably have seen 
often can get mutations if the patient is not 100% adherent to the antiretroviral therapy. And I wanted to take this time uh, just to go into some of the latest antiretroviral therapies. Um, I want to give credit to Dr. Michael Verrata at the Yale School of Medicine who originally came up with this plan um, back in the day when we used whiteboards and chalkboards and I kind of just elect made it more electronic and put it on PowerPoint and added some additional medications. Um, I did see him recently at the IDSA meeting in 2018. He did give me his blessing and promised he'll uh, give me some pointers uh, if he sees any need for updates. Um, this is tenofovir, tenofovir al alafenamide, TIF, which is the new version of tenofovir. It's a, um, a nucleotide um, inside a reverse transcription inhibitor class. Um, together they make Descovy. Uh, tenofovir, which is TDF, brand name Viriad, um, combined with intracytabine does give Truvada, which is what we use currently for PrEP. Um, Abacavir and Lamivudine uh, do give um, Epsicom and Zidavidine and Lamivudine do give Combavir. Now we do have um, a new medication called uh, Symduo, which is essentially um, it's the uh, Lamivudine and uh, TDF uh, version. Now we know a tripla is a Favarin's plus your Trivada, so the TDF-FTC of Favarin's. Repivirine and the TIF-FTC will give you RDFC. Um, Complera is made up of the TDF-FTC and Repivirine, and the Dalutegravir combined with Repivirine gives Jaluca, which is an excellent two drug formulations for individuals without any hepatitis B infection, so hepatitis B core negative. Um, and no risk of new hepatitis B infection. This is particularly wonderful for our older uh, patients living with HIV because uh, it's a very low side effect, side effect profile and it's very highly um, tolerated. So when you have um, dalutegravir with the abacavir lamivudine, it becomes triumac, and then there's the trivirine and the verapine, and there's also deravirine, which is a new medication. Um, and then we also have the elvitegravir cobacistat with Descovy with your Genvoya. Now, we do have that older Strival medication uh, the, with the TDF-FTC, and then the Victarvi is our new formulation. And um, these are the, the older PIs, uh, Darunavir, Ritonavir, and then boosted also with Cobacistat, Atazanavir and Ritonavir, and also Atazanavir comes with Cobacistat, Fosamprenavir can be with or without Ritonavir. You can give unboosted Atazanavir um, or Fosamprenavir, and then Laponavir does come with Ritonavir as a fixed dose combination um, with Kali it's called Kalitra. Now we have um, new classes, the entry inhibitor. We knew about Maravaroc, but there's um, Fostemsevir and Infuviratide, um, which has been along uh, a while. Uh, we also have Simtuza, which is the Prescobix, which is the Dorothea Cobacistat, and the TFFTC combination. Um, and then the, the uh, deravirine, as we mentioned, um, the deravirine plus the TDF uh, 3TC is Delstrigo. Um, and then we have a new monoclonal antibody, um, abeluzumab, um, which I think is still difficult to administer um, because it is intravenous. Um, and then the calbutegravir, of course, the long acting, which is very exciting as an injectable integrase inhibitors, which is um, in the final trials now. So we wanted to um, highlight, uh, this is also from the National HIV curriculum, when antiretroviral therapy is started, uh, it takes approximately, classically, um, 12 weeks for the virus to suppress. Um, I think we've, we've all seen it uh, even as little as, as three weeks with an integrase inhibitor regimen, but classically it's about 12 to 16 weeks for full suppression. Um, and usually that's the end of the story. It reaches subclinical le levels if, if someone is uh, adherent to the medication. But when ART no longer becomes effective, um, most of the time it is due to adherence problems because we try to take baseline genotypes. Um, and there's, there can be escape or if there's a new illness. Um, and sometimes we see a rebound of uh, HIV virus. And so then we're worried about resistance to the medications. So. What we see here, also from the HIV curriculum, is that you have a, a pretreatment um, resistant 
Um, you have a pretreatment HIV viral pool, if you will, where you have a lot of wild type HIV, but you have some resistant strains that may or may not be picked up on the initial genotype, depending if you're doing ultra deep sequencing or whether you're doing commercial labs. And the initial response usually is good, but if there's any kind of inherent problems, there's viral breakthrough, and those viruses that you know may have not been causing problems in latency period, unfortunately, uh, can replicate and be selected out and um, can multiply. So this is also a wonderful slide from the National HIV Curriculum talking about conventional HIV drug resistance assay versus your um, HIV DNA genotype resistant assay. Why I wanted to highlight this particularly is that um, there are certain ways of doing your drug resistance assay and, and knowing which ones you have are, are pretty important. Um, so just to kind of understand what your lab is, is doing, um, so you, you have um, accurate amplification, but uh, for all intents and purposes, um, your commercial assay should be um, good to understand what your resistance patterns are. Um, this is convulsion bulk sequencing, um, and um, basically this is just showing that um, conventional bulk sequencing will give you some information has about a 20% detection threshold, but if you really want to understand um, what the resistance is doing, sometimes you have to go to um, research labs or specialty centers for um, further uh, deep sequencing. And this is a, a classic example of um, even, so if you can look at patient two, um, HIV DNA was detected, but below the assay's limit. Um, so you, you do usually have virus there, but the lab may not be able to to find it depending on your assay. So what that is to say is that even if someone's undetectable, there's probably um, some virus in circulation or in the reservoir. Resistance on a molecular level, so this is also an excellent slide from the National HIV Curriculum. Um, you'll see that the NRTIs, um, and what you're seeing here is that the NRTIs are the medications that are now blocking um, the incorporation of the host nucleotide, so instead of um, the, the machinery operating as normal kind of adds a, a cog or a, a block in the cog of the wheel and uh, stops that, that replication process. Um, so what you have to know about the NNRTI resistance patterns, and this is um, a wonderful site, the AIS USA site, um, which, is, sorry, which is readily available online. Um, and I should have highlighted it. Well, I'll do some mouse. Uh, you can see here that um, resistance can emerge. And the, why are there certain sites? Well, it's because of the certain pockets of the proteins and what is more susceptible than others. Um, so specifically for the NRTI mutations, we commonly see the M1A4V, um, which is um, the, the native um, at the 184 codon. There's a, a change um, in, um, in the conformation. And same with the K65R. So this is also the protease enzyme. So as we talked about, there are specific parts of the HIV virus that are susceptible to resistance. And I think this was a great slide because it showed where the active site of the protease enzyme is. And so you can imagine that if there are conformational changes in, in this site, it's going to, uh, some of them are going to have a little bit more effect than others depending on uh, what the change is. That's why some mutations are, uh, quote, stronger or more um, serious than others. So the protease inhibitors, you can see, um, so for example, um, a common one, right, I50V. So then you look for your 50 here, and that, that's kind of what's going on here. And then um, you can see how an IC and leucine begins uh, changes to a, um, to a leucine uh, at the uh, 50 codon mark, and that's the mutation there. Um, so I thought that was a nice example. Same with um, the other sites as well. Um, this is the um, NNRTI uh, binding pocket. Um, and I think this should probably read NNRTI binding pocket on the top. But in any case, um, this is what uh, we're seeing is that it's blocked again. And so that's the same thing as the drugs are designed to, to block that conformational change. Now when the, um, the virus mutates, it, it goes around uh, that mechanism and uh, the amino acids are, are substitutes. So you can see 
one of the most common ones is at 103, um, which is what we see uh, clinically. Uh, also, this is uh, just another way of seeing it. So you can see the uh, K103N uh, mutation is the one we see most often. And um, it's, it's no accident because that's where it, it uh, seems to be most critical on the, um, the physical uh, protein. And you can see here, this is um, another list of, of mutations that are the most um, common. These are the major primary integrase mutations. Uh, you can see here the HIV integrase inhibitor. Um, and I think these we're just understanding more and more. But you can see that each protein is very distinct in terms of shape. And um, you can see there are certainly uh, people uh, very expert in this who can explain it much better. But suffice it to say, I wanted to share with you um, just a general foundation so you can kind of get to know the general codons that we look for in specific drug classes which correspond to specific proteins um, in, the, um, in the HIV viro, uh, virion. Um, we have raltegravir resistance pathways um, and basically um, you're, you're going to be needing um, usually about um, for dalutegravir, you, you need multiple, but for ralutegravir, uh, you do need a combination for that to, to take effect. Uh, you can see that there are some primary mutations for uh, ralutegravir specifically, and there are secondary, and those are um, often additive, but there are specific ones um, that matter more than others, and your uh, genotype will be able to, to tell you which combinations um, would be resistance. Um, you can still use dalutegravir if you have raltegravir resistance. You just have to use raltegravir twice a day on some of those mutations. So how do you have solutions? Well, here's a, a general map. And I think what you have to think about is, yes, you are avoiding the drug that it's resistance to, but also you're trying to give the patient options where they'll be um, compliant with the new regimen. So for example, an M184V is the most common mutation we see. Um, so that means that we really can't use a back of your intracytabine or lamivudine. Um, as we know, it, it does impart uh, more sensitivity to tenofovir and AZT, which is good. Um, sometimes if they don't have hepatitis B or they're not at risk for it, you can just skip that class altogether and go right to a, a dalutegravir to ripivirine with a Jaluca, and there's some evidence um, that, that um, there is, it works just fine. Um, some people will um, sometimes add a, a protease inhibitor onto, let's say, like a Genvoy or a Bictarvi combination. I wouldn't really suggest that because you don't want to give two boosters in the same regimen. Um, so I would, I would really try to uh, be strategic in terms of how you're going to overcome the resistance, um, choosing your new medication and ensuring adherence. Um, so MWA4V, yes, it is good to use a protease inhibitor. They're very robust, but if you can um, even avoid those, that's, that's good too. Um, we do like the two-drug regimen. You can test for a CCR5 troposin, so you can use Moravirac. But um, I wouldn't add a single drug to a failing regimen, which is a good guideline also for your TB therapy. You really want to try to get a fresh uh, regimen of at least three active drugs uh, if they're Hep B core positive. And you really want to understand why there's difficulty with adherence and barriers to care. Um, so that's essentially it. Um, there's um, a lot of information out there, including the Stanford um, HIV resistance database, which is excellent. Um, you can actually plug in uh, specific mutations. Um, and there's a lot of good lectures out there, specifically by uh, Dr. Joe Enron, about um, how different mutations will impart um, um, degrees, if you will, of um, resistance so that not all mutations um, are uh, equally uh, devastating to your uh, biologic control. Um, and that's uh, it for now. Thank you so much.